I wouldn't want to take my life because it's going to get so weird and I just want to see it. I want to see what humanity does because I think we're at a crossroads right now where we can either buckle down and really create quite a fantastic world or we can give up. Hey there, my name is Sean and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives and we almost never talk about it. We certainly don't talk about it enough. And when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, are not very good at it. So one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. Please remember, we are trying to help more people in more places feel a little less shitty and a little less alone and you know what as you probably already know that today this monday morning this is episode number 200 which just feels like a kind of big deal as always a huge thank you to anybody and everybody who's been involved however you have been involved massive massive thank you I want to share with you a couple of other things. As you know, we have a membership and you can learn more about that, among other things, in the show notes. And we will soon be having these small little get-togethers with members who we will talk about an issue or two relating to suicide. And I plan to release them as special episodes. So I think that's going to be really cool. Also, I mentioned in the past, I want to do guest updates and I have not followed through much with that. So I am making a real concerted effort to do more of that moving forward this year and beyond. And one final thing, where the fuck are all the men? Ironically, today's conversation is with a man, but dudes, you're out there. Where are you? 80% of my conversations here are with women. That's amazing. That's great. I love all of you who reach out and all of you who join me. But guys, I don't know if you're ever going to hear this because you may not be looking for this stuff. And I know my words here probably won't make much of a difference. But I want to tell you something. There's a lot of people out there, and a lot of men in particular, who need to hear you. That is my rant. If you are a suicide attempt survivor, however you identify, and want to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or X at Suicide Noted. As I've mentioned, you can check the show notes to learn about all kinds of other things. You can rate and review us on Apple and now a relatively new feature on Spotify. If you go into the episode show notes, you can leave a comment and I'd love to hear from you as I'm sure our listeners would as well. Finally, we're talking about suicide on this podcast. Like the name suggests, like we've been doing since the summer of 2020. So keep that in mind before you listen or as you listen, because we don't hold back. But I do hope you listen, because there is so much to learn. Today, I am talking with Ben. Ben lives in California, and he is a suicide attempt survivor. Hey, Ben. Are you driving? I am about to pull over. I just got out of the exit. I'm going to turn right and go down the street. You're good. You're good. I don't want to kill you. I don't want you to kill yourself while you're fucking driving. And I don't mean kill yourself like podcast. I mean like. No, yeah, we're fine. I found a um, a nice little parking lot. All right. So, Mr. Ben, can I call you Ben? Yeah. Yeah. California. Do you remember why you reached out to me in the first place? Yeah, I just, I had, I haven't been able to listen to every one of your um podcast unfortunately um but i had listened to a few i listened to a few from california and specifically i think one from san diego i thought it was really good what you were doing i just think it's a good i haven't really seen anybody else doing this maybe i'm just um uninformed but um you know i'm not the only one i i have friends who could definitely be on this podcast so and i think that especially like now this is just a big issue that we need to talk about and just being more open, like the communication is good. Oh, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, uh, I guess, trusting me. And then not most people don't search for suicide stuff online. Why, why, why were you looking for that? I'm the type of person who I need to understand how things work. Both my parents are engineers, so I have a very logic-based approach to things. So when I was diagnosed with depression and I had you know, people telling me 
you know, you need to get help. When it first happened, I was pretty resistant. Like, um, I think like a lot of people are just not willing to accept that I had an issue. Eventually, I just thought I need to learn as much about this as I can, use as many resources as I can to figure out what is wrong and try to improve as best I can. And, um, and also just figure out how I can help other people too, who might be going through the same thing. When was that? When were you diagnosed? I think it was my junior year of college. I was in a fraternity at San Diego State, and I was just drinking like a maniac, heavily addicted to nicotine, you know, doing some other drugs here and there, but nothing, um, and just not getting any sleep and hanging out with people that I think in retrospect, I think they actually were really great people. I just, I felt very out of place. Um, Greek life is It's a lot about appearances, kind of hard to get below the surface. Um, But basically, I blacked out at a party leading up to this. I had been, you know, like just going off on my own, like going to the library alone, going to, you know, random spa. Like I wanted to sleep all the time, but I knew that people thought that would be weird and people would know something's up. So I would like sleep under random, like I slept under a, under a random like staircase in a building one time, slept on random like benches around the school. I had taken an Uber down to Coronado. It's a famous area in San Diego. Um, There's a bridge. That's where people do it. I had it all planned out. And then we had a party. We had like a social with one of the sororities. I blacked out and I was telling this girl like what I was going to do and all this stuff. The next morning, I didn't even, you know, I woke up like, oh, whatever, another day. And my roommate was like, hey, man, like, do you know what about last night? Or do you remember anything? And I was like, no. So basically, the, the president immediately called my parents um, that night. Like they had brought me into a room and I had been like telling them like everything I was going to do. And the president called my mom and my dad. And that was when I had to first see a psychiatrist at uh, at SDSU. And he gave me the diagnosis. Wow. Okay. So you dove right in there. So just to be clear, you were at SDSU. Sounds like you were dealing with depression without knowing necessarily it was depression. Yeah. I mean, I definitely had underlying things from childhood. Like Yeah, it's been a long time, but I think the extreme drinking and extreme just culture of SDSU as a whole and specifically the Greek life was, you know, like you are very basically told if you're not having sex with a lot of attractive women, you don't matter. It's kind of insane. Yeah. Do they explicitly say that about women? I mean... No, but, you know, it's it's always being talked about, you know, like Mm. we got to get hot come to the parties and like, you know, a common saying is like, oh, this guy fucks like that means this guy's like sick because he fucks because he fucks hot girls. You know, I was so depressed for a bunch of other reasons, like I wasn't doing very well with girls. So then that like compounded and just like and other stuff like I had dated a girl my freshman year who was in a sorority, but the Greek life is very tiered. So she was in what is considered a bottom sorority at SCSU. So once when I came to my fraternity who by, you know, they're not like the top dogs, but that's the problem is there's a lot of insecurity and, you know, like I got kind of shit on for having dated her. And yeah. Wow. Yeah. The culture is horrible. It's, um, it's terrible for your mental health. It's crazy that more people, I mean, I think a lot of people are depressed and they just are really good at faking it. Yeah, which almost always is not good. You went from not feeling so well and not, and I'm using my words a little bit, but I'm taking from what you shared, going through the stuff. And then you you said you walked to the bridge where it's not uncommon people jump in that area, but that was a big leap. Like, and, and I don't mean that in a weird word leap. Like what got you from wherever you were? And I know you could go all the way back to childhood if you choose to here. There's a lot going on, but that's a big You know what I'm saying? It's a big difference from thinking about like, I'm, things are really hard to, I'm going to jump. This is the thing. I come from a fairly privileged background, so I don't want to speak for, I don't think that I know what's right, buddy, but I will say that the substances you put in your body, I think have a very strong impact. You got to keep in mind, I was at this point, I was blacking, I would black out like two, maybe three times a week. I was like showing up to class drunk taking quizzes drunk like 
it was insane. So I really think it was the alcohol. Like there were seeds, but I think it was the alcohol. And then also I just kind of felt like nobody cared. Yeah. Like because of superficial nature of Greek life, like even people that I thought were my good friends, a lot of times, like, you know, I'd go off by myself all day, multiple days in a week and no text. Nobody's asking where I am. Nobody, you know, nobody cared. So, or at least that's how it felt. I think it was those two combining factors were probably the biggest thing. Do you remember that day? We can go as granular as you want or not. Was there a reason it was that day or was it just today's the day? Yeah, I don't even uh, No, I don't think it was planned very. I mean, it probably was just like, what is my class schedule? Or I don't even know. Um, Yeah, I don't remember the specific. It it probably was on a weekend, maybe. Yeah, I just went to I just took an Uber from SDSU. It's probably about 30 minutes. And uh, it's very nice. Uh, Coronado is a really very upscale, super wealthy area. And they know about the bridge, too. So, like, when, when I got there, like, they make it really hard to get up there. Like, there's a, they, they've mitigated it very well. But I mostly just kind of walked around alone at the beach um, or walked around, like, the neighborhoods. I went into, like, maybe, a, I don't know, like, some store. But, um, yeah, mostly just walking around unhappy. <laughs> And you have no one you feel comfortable talking to about this at this point? No, I've come a very long way. Um, this was when I was 21 or 20 maybe still. And yeah, probably 20. And I'm 25 now. I have two clo- very close friends that I talk to. I talk to my parents to varying degrees. I talk to my sister, uh, my my aunt to, to varying degrees. But yeah, I have two or three very close friends that I can talk to about this stuff for sure. When you were walking on the beach that day, though, they either weren't around or you didn't feel comfortable calling them, I imagine. Yeah. So this when I was living in the frat, I kind of cut off. I still had my one really good friend who went to SDSU, but he was very busy. Um, He was like working a lot. He was the president of a club. He's a very high. He's just an incredible person. Um, So he had a lot going on. Yeah, I don't know why it is kind of crazy looking back on it, why I didn't reach out to him. I mean, I know we talked about it at some point around there. Uh, oh. But and then the other the other really close friend, he was uh, Cal Poly. Cal Poly Slow is in San Luis Obispo. It's about nine hours north of San Diego. So um, but that was a friend from childhood uh, mm-hmm. who I'm still friends with. But yeah, he was just far away. And like he was with other friends of ours from high school like he just seemed like everything was going really well because i didn't like to bother people yeah i think that's not uncommon at what point during that day did you turn around how how close do you get essentially i found out pretty fast i wasn't going to get up that bridge they're ready to tackle a per like to get a guy and i think they also have a net now or something like they've they know about it. Like they're aware of it. So uh, I found out pretty fast, like once I walked over there from wherever I got dropped off, that wasn't happening. I just didn't have any other ideas and probably just didn't actually really want to do it. But I just didn't want to be around people. So I think I just want, yeah, I just waited until probably like eight or nine, maybe even 10 at night. And then I got my Uber back. That must have been weird. Yeah, it was very strange. I, I think the issue with this generation, I don't know, maybe it's not just this generation, but the issue with social media now is that people don't really, like when I came back, nobody even noticed, like people just don't really, I don't know, maybe it's not social media, but yeah, I came back and everyone's just like, oh, okay. Like nobody, it wasn't even a a big thing. Like, I don't think anybody even thought about it. The thing is, I was also on the club soccer team at the time. They may have just thought I was hanging out with other people I don't know but no nobody ever really questioned me where I was like nobody cared um or nobody thought to think to ask me so we can only speculate but do you think that's different than whatever number of years ago you know I I can't speak in certainty but I have I did read a study that said that they are finding they're linking high social media usage to lower levels of empathy in people and you kind of it with the current climate of I got rid of pretty much all my social media. I just have Facebook and that's to talk to like older relatives and I barely look at it. But because you see it now, like people are fighting about everything. There's no common ground. 
they get sucked into the algorithm and they don't really question things. They don't question what's being fed to them. I don't know. You know, um, there's this great documentary uh, called The Social Dilemma on mm-hmm. Netflix. You know, I, I recommend it to anybody, especially anybody struggling with mental health. Um, and definitely just to anybody who wants to try to live a more balanced, moderated life, I would say. Mm. It changed my perspective on a lot of things. And it helped me like when I, I when I deleted all my social media, I definitely felt a lot better. Did you so when you came back, you got diagnosed with depression, like what happens next that you do just a few things that pop into my head here? Do you stay in the fraternity? Do you stop drinking? Yeah. So what they told me, and this is my, I have a lot of frustrations with psychiatrists because so basically, you know, the guy immediately is like, we need to put you on meds. And I fought it for a little while, but then my parents were also like, nope, you're going on meds. The psychiatrist said so. But then the psychiatrist says, now that you're on the meds, you can't drink. I've been binge drinking like a psychopath for the last you know however long like Mm -hmm. my body is not just gonna give up drink especially when there's a huge social component so i left i i started taking classes at community college i I went back home to live with my parents was taking the pills but then you know i was at home for a few weeks whatever things seem like they're getting better and then i get a text from one of my friends in the fraternity like hey we're having a party like Everybody wants you, like, misses, like, you should come back, see everybody. And I went back. The pills will make you black out worse, like, you black out sooner. And also, I don't, there was a long period where I had a problem with drinking alone. So I may have been doing that also, but probably was. But basically, I went back and my social anxiety was so bad, like, being back around all those people that I had, you know, in my mind looked weak, I don't know, or made a fool of myself. I don't know how to put it, but I already had not felt like I fit in with them. Um, but I came back and then I blacked out really hard. Yeah, it just was not good. Mm-hmm. That's my thing is I feel like psychiatrists are so quick to want you to take pills and stuff when they should wait and see if you can get sober on your own first before they start just throwing pills into the mix because pills and alcohol do not interact very well yeah. often. When you were uh, up until 20 years old, up until that, that day, frankly, like, were you ideating at all? Or was that really more just towards the end before that day? No, I had had, I had had some instances. Yeah. Middle school actually was when I first kind of started showing signs of stuff. I, we just didn't get an official diagnosis. We definitely have mental health, like in the family, my mom's bipolar my mom's grandfather was an alcoholic. My dad and his mom both have like extreme anxiety. I would definitely say my dad has depression. And then his grandfather on that side with his mom, uh, my grandma told me that he used to come home when she was a kid from work and just stare at the wall for like Mm. hours. We definitely have something just in us, I think, potentially that we need to do extra work to combat. Um, but yeah, when I was a kid, I definitely, I know there was one time that I was playing around with fire and whiteout. And then I like lit something on fire by accident. And then my parents thought I was trying to kill myself, but I wasn't. Um, Hmm. but I do know that had other instances of being really, really depressed and, um, you know, having other issues. You never seriously considered it until 20 years old. Yeah. It was mostly just like really bad depression. Like at the end of high school, I had some pretty bad depression. Mm -hmm. Um, But look back on it, that was definitely linked to substance. That's when I started abusing substances. So, Uh yeah. this That would be, I believe, a first on this show. So whatever this is, a program. What the fuck is this? Whatever it is. It's a podcast episode uh, where someone tried to self-immolate. I've never heard of anyone trying to burn themselves to death. It's happened in the world, just not with me. From what I remember about that, it's kind of shitty, but I think I just had burned something and yeah. was a 12 year old and just played it off like I was trying to hurt myself so they wouldn't get mad at me, which is mm-hmm. really bad. But I do remember at that age starting having kind of suicidal, you know, not like deep like planning, but definitely like just having existential crisis crises around that age pretty frequently. 
So we let's play the guessing game here. Do you think if you never start drinking, you don't go to the bridge? Probably, yeah. Probably you don't go to the bridge. Yeah, I doubt it. Do you think if there's if that bridge has no guards and no net and it's easy that day that you get up there and maybe jump? Probably, yeah. Well, I don't know. That's hard to say. I'd say it's at least a 50-50. Yeah, I mean, you can't know what it's like to stand on the edge, right? Yeah. Now, how many people did you tell? If you've heard the podcast, you probably hear some of these questions that I ask it. Just so curious in getting into people's, I don't know, minds or their their how they're feeling. Do you talk about it at all? About that day? That day. And then I guess the bigger, the broader stuff of all things going on. Yeah, I've talked to deeply, really getting into it. I've probably talked to maybe like four to six people. Well, okay, four to six friends. And then obviously, like my parents pretty much know everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, My sister. I don't, my sister's the weird one because I don't know what my parents have told her. And I know that I definitely don't think I've told her everything. Mm -hmm. Um, But I tap her some stuff. What's weird is when you're with your family, I feel like I'm more likely to, like, I've been trying to, you know, they tell you, or what I've read is like, honesty is better. Um, It's always better to be honest. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's a gray area. But, you know, like a lot of times, sometimes I will tell my parents like half truths, unfortunately, because I worry about them worrying. I don't know. It's probably not the right thing to do, but I do it. I think I see sometimes, you know, the idea of like, quote, just talk about it, just talk about it. I get the sentiment behind that, but I think there's there's probably a good number of people out there who could say, well, I did that and it didn't, it backfired. It's a tough one. You were 20 then, you're 25 now. Did you finish school? Yes, but I came very close to dropping out. Yeah, there's there was a lot of ups and downs. But yes, I did end up finishing. Uh, it took me five years or five and a half. But yeah, I finished. What What did you study? I'm curious. I got into the school for international business. And then I quickly transferred to Spanish. I wanted to be a Spanish teacher. Mm. Uh, but then drinking and, you know, just doing stupid crap all the time. Uh, at the higher levels, Spanish was getting too hard. So at SDSU, they have a program called interdisciplinary studies. It's a fantastic program if you're not using it to run away from your problems. So what I did was I did Spanish, bilingual education, and communications. If my Spanish were good enough, could we do this interview in a, could we do this conversation in Spanish? Would you be able to do it? I would have to think a, a lot about it. It probably wouldn't be as good. It'd be hard to uh, communicate some of these ideas. Yeah. Maybe if you sent me all the questions and then I I like wrote it all down first, maybe. Right. Anyone who's listening, they don't know. Ben is in a car somewhere off of a road somewhere near. Can I say the town? Yeah, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, which was a soap opera. I heard it's beautiful up there. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a great, great place. The people are very kind of hippie vibes, which is definitely I I like um yeah it's a great place. I also hear it's expensive as fuck as they say AF. Yes, um luckily I so I live up in the mountains. I don't live in the city. I work for the Boys and Girls Club at a camp, an outdoor ed school. So mm-hmm. I have uh housing that comes with my job. It's not great housing, it's free. So you can live in Santa Barbara and work there. Yeah, it's awesome. So far it's been great. That's great. Do you call it a, a near attempt or an attempt? How would you characterize that day? Uh, that day is a near attempt. I have had other uh, attempts, unfortunately. That was kind of the beginning of stuff. You don't have to talk about anything you don't want to talk about, but I always encourage people if they're comfortable. I still believe strongly, and I don't think this is going to change, that people, you know, they really do benefit from hearing this. It's hard to find people who talk so honestly about these kinds of things. Yeah, just like the um, transparency, honesty, like, I don't really care. Like, I would tell a person on the street any of this stuff. I just don't have any shame about it. I, I don't feel bad talking about it. If somebody from the Boys and Girls Club in a position of authority happens to hear this, do you think your job's in danger? I doubt it. So it's if you're 25 and you've been pretty decent for the last year or two, and that first near attempt was 20, then what is happening uh, between 20-ish and 23-ish where it sounds like, do you know how many other attempts or near attempts you had? I don't know the exact number. When alcohol is involved and blackouts are involved, 
you could wake up somewhere and you may have done something, but you have no idea what you tried to do kind of thing. So I have one main one that the big one that I consider is the big one that you just referred to the most recent one. No, actually, it was pretty soon after the bridge and stuff like that. What happened? Remember how I was talking about I they put me on the pill and then the pills, you know, they accentuate the effects of the alcohol. So I went to this party. There was this girl that I had been really wanting to see. I was just like really way more into this girl than made sense. So the last two things I remember from going to this party was I was upstairs with some of the guys from my pledge class. This guy in my pledge class, he was very with the in-group in the fraternity, kind of the people that I felt like, like I wanted to be friends with them, but I felt like they didn't like me. But he was always really nice to me. Really, really cool dude. I saw him like out, um, just out in the San Diego nightlife. I saw him like probably a year, I don't know how long ago, but he's a great guy. And I remember sitting next to him I didn't really want to drink too much, but then I was like, it was me, him, and a lot of like the quote unquote cool kids that I felt really anxious around. So I started taking more shots and I didn't think I had taken that many. And this is where the pill comes in when it, when it makes everything hit way harder. And then the other thing I remember was finally like whenever they have a, whenever fraternities, at least at SCSU, when they have a party, they do a pre-party. So the sorority comes. You guys do a little thing with just the sorority that comes and then afterwards more other girls. So the last thing I remember was I was, you know, I felt really good because I had been away from all this. I think I had been doing well so sober wise too. And that was helping the work better. But then I had already started drinking upstairs. And then when I came down, there were these two girls from the um, sorority that came in. And the last thing I remember is like walking up to them. And being like, hey, like, let's go to the bar. Like, they have um, whatever, like, the little, like, uh, jungle juice shots or whatever stupid idiot college thing. And the last thing I remember is just, like, talking to them, like, having a good conversation, and then just lights out. And I just Hmm. woke up uh, in what had happened. And I didn't find out until days later. But I had blacked out. And then this girl that I had been really wanting to see, I had basically in in a blackout like thought that she wanted to kiss me and like probably make out with her yeah she was like you know she wasn't even mad about it but i just was i think up until recently i have always had an issue with being very hard on myself to points that don't even make any sense um Mm -hmm. but in this case when i really did like i would have been hard on myself for other things that actually didn't matter, but this was like pretty serious. So I really just berated the negative self talk was um, very bad. The guilt, um, just the absolute self hatred um, after that mistake. So I drove drove up the highway to a remote area, and um, I had bought um, some like sleep sleep aid stuff, and I drank like the whole bottle. And I also took like a bunch of my pills, um, like the the antidepressants that they had given me. Surprisingly, I didn't drink any alcohol. That's the weird part, because probably if I had done that, it might have been really, really bad. But yeah, basically, I thought what was going to happen was I would like, you know, my breathing would get really shallow and I'd like fall asleep. What actually ended up happening was it felt like my blood was like my body was just like. I don't even know, not on fire. I don't know how to explain it, but it just felt bad. I could feel my blood like coursing through my body and it felt weird. And I just was kind of like squirming around in my car uh, for like five hours, like until like morning. And when I got back on the road, my eyes like had dilated or something like something was up with it had affected my eyes like I couldn't. I mean, I could, I drove home, but everything was way brighter than it should have been. Also, because of the pill overdose, my dick like stopped working. Like when I got home, I couldn't pee. I couldn't, uh, like I couldn't get, I couldn't get an erection. Like my, my dick was just dead. And I don't remember how long I dealt with that. The only way I could pee, I remember was I would get hot water and put my hands in hot water. And that's the only way I could pee. I feel like that's dangerous really dangerous not the hot water like not being able to urinate yeah no it's and 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 it was terror it was scaring the shit out of me 
like so eventually i don't remember how long i might not have even not gone that whole day but eventually i just i went to the doctor i went to urgent care and i was like hey like my penis is not functioning like at all and the lady you know i think she knew maybe something was up um i don't know if she knew it was what it was or maybe she just thought it was a drug abuse general thing but she started asking me questions and kind of being like hey like you know how are you doing what's up and like i really just wanted them to like fix me get me out of there and go home and not like have my parents not find out but eventually she basically you know talked me like kept coming at like kept drilling me until i admitted what had been going on and she was like yeah we're we're i'm sorry we need to get your we need to get somebody in here with you um so my parents they gave me uh some kind of this like weird drink that i had to drink that like fixed it um but i had to stay in the er i think uh overnight and my parents came yeah it was like the craziest like that experience made me like i will never overdose on pills again of any kind because i was just like this is so crazy like it just shut off a, a part of my body that like i absolutely need to filter out toxins did you go to a psych unit at all um yeah so then shortly after that i got checked in and i did uh i did a month of outpatient where i think it was like i would go in three times a week or something they didn't drug test you every time but i definitely got drug tested and yeah you would do like therapy sessions every day and other activities and like group talks and yeah that was the interesting experience i met this guy that um we got along really well um he ended up moving to new york we didn't stay in touch but um yeah so that was like a whole another thing but yeah i did outpatient and when i came out of outpatient i was pretty good um and i had been sober that whole month or it might have been 2 months Yeah, sadly I think that is the last time I was like I've been that's my big thing now. Like I would say my depression is a lot better, but the the beating the substance abuse is still kind of a struggle. Drinking. Yeah. Well, and I smoke weed here and there. Mhm. Never heard that before about what happened after you took those pills or the uh, what you drank. I've never heard that. Yeah, I mean I don't actually know which one caused what. It, one of the weirdest physiological things I've ever had happen to me. Did, was there ever a point after that up until we're talking now I suppose where you wish that that attempt had been successful that it had worked and you had died? Yeah, I'm sure there were times after that that I felt that way. The thing is, I read an article once that said that suicidal people don't actually want to be dead. They just want the pain to be over. and i that really resonated with me because i when i look back when i reflect on all of those times where i felt that way or did things reckless things i felt like you know i don't actually really want to die like i have a lot of things in my life that i enjoy if i just think about it i just don't like who i am right now or i don't like my situation or i don't like the world the world is too messed up or you know something but it's never really been like i want to die when you actually dive below the surface i know you said some of them it's a little blurry and and that was the big one what do you ideate somewhat regularly however you precisely define the word ideate it's been a while yeah an actual attempt attempt it's probably been many a long time but you know here and there throughout the last few years i definitely like the self mutilation stuff here and there definitely came up a little bit but i you know it was always it's never been super drastic like i've never like cut a vein or anything i have gotten really mad at my like i've i've actually punched myself in the face like super hard before stuff like that punched myself in the chest but um it's been a really long time i mean it's probably been at least half a year since any of that kind of stuff and even before that it was very random and very like not to the level of like you know hitting a vein and you know having blood every like it was never like in fact i usually would try to not if i was going to do something like that i kind of just wanted the thing is the problem is is once you learn about um you know dopamine and how your body self regulates 
Like the reason why cutting feels good is because you do the pain and then the release of the pain is what feels good. It's not the pain. People think pain is pleasure. It's the release of the pain. That's why exercise feels so good because once you're done with it, your body's like, oh, thank God it's over Mm -hmm. and it rewards you. So once I understood that, I knew like, oh, I'm feeling down. You know, if I just dig this knife a little bit, like not even cutting blood, but just dig it into my leg for a little bit, then I know, then when I release it, I know I'll get a little rush of whatever. But now I try to think more like, why would you do that when you can go for a run or do some pushups or, you know, lift some weights or, you know, even meditation, at least for me is extremely painful. Uh, It's so hard to focus for that long. There's just so many other things you can do to get that uh, rush back that are much more productive. Yeah. Were you ever inpatient even for a short period of time? No. Um, We had discussed at one point me going into like a sober living place. Um, And I had been going to, there's this thing in San Diego. I think maybe they have it in other cities, but it was big in San Diego. That's an app you can get called the Phoenix. And it's for people with people who are trying to, you know, uh, addicts who are trying to quit. And they will put on events, San Diego at least, like I got to go rock climbing for free a few times, uh, free pickleball. Um, It's a really great um, app. But I met some people there that were in the sober living situation. And after meeting them, I was just like, well, and this is the crappy thing. I've heard this before that there's the thing of like, I'm not, well, I'm not that bad because I would meet these people and they would just look like. It would be like pale, pale, pale. Clearly some serious stuff had happened. Like I just didn't see myself in them. And I just was like, dang, well, if this is what the whole house is going to be like, you know, I don't know if that's really going to be a good environment for me. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm actually still, I am open to the idea of sober living now. Yeah, it would be, um, I think just the, the idea of it just for base level for a lot of people can be kind of daunting because then you're really like saying like then you have to tell people if you want to hang out with them it's like no sorry i can't yeah it's like a it's like you said earlier when when the doctor said you can't drink part of, you know is the medication but it's also like social yeah exactly like that expectation for me to just be able to flip a switch when i when that's like how even even if you're not in a fraternity or a sorority like the average college kid is going pretty nuts anyway. For that to be the expectation that I'm just going to be able to do that was kind of ridiculous to me to be mm. like, okay, we're going to give you this pill, but we're going to tell you that you can't drink on the pill, but we're not going to actually restrain you in any way. Like, we're just going to let you go out there. The likelihood of that working is very low. Yeah, it just made absolutely no sense to me. And, and this guy, the psychiatrist, like, great guy, nice guy, meant really well. I'm on medication now. I, you know, my parents have basically, my whole family kind of was like, you gotta listen to the experts. Like, you don't know, but to me on the face of these things, I'm just like, this doesn't make logical sense. It seems a little, you know, big pharma. I don't know. It's, I don't want to be that conspiracy guy, but it's hard to not be nowadays with when it comes to, when you see how predatory a lot of businesses are. So you you got diagnosed by a doctor that said you were uh, depressed. Is that right? Yeah. So that same guy that um, started me on those pills, uh, he was the one that gave the official documented Mm -hmm. depression. I think that depression is very complex. I think that I notice a lot of people, I meet so many people of my generation that we, they'll be like, oh yeah, I have depression. I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, I'm on this medication. Oh, me too. But then I look at their lifestyle versus my lifestyle. And for me, I just kind of know, like, if I could eliminate alcohol, pretty much everything would take off. Um, Because I, you know, I'm very active. I try to eat fairly healthy. Like I do a lot of the other work. And alcohol seems to be the main thing. But I meet these kids. I I don't want to be in the camp that says depression isn't real, because I don't believe that either. But I meet them. And they're like, well, I play video games all day. Um, I sit in my room. I eat garbage all this and it's like i don't know that you're depressed as nobody taught you discipline and then on top of it some of them are drinking although some of them aren't drinking um when you have a substance when you're addicted to a substance and that's the other thing like is that depression or is that addiction so it's hard like i I very rarely meet a person who's doing everything right 
and then is still depressed. Because that, I think, is when I'm like, you clinically, biologically, physiologically, something is in there that is not right. But a lot of the people I meet, it's like video games 24-7. They never get any sunlight. They mm -hmm. All their social interactions are parasocial. They're playing video games with their friends online. Like they're talking to a person, but they've done studies. You need to see a human person, even us talking over Zoom. This isn't good enough. Like if this was my whole life is just Zoom conversations, I'd slowly go insane. Mm -hmm. Humans are not meant for this. So that's the thing. It's like, I don't know if you're depressed as it sucks. It sounds so bad, but someone needs to push you to do the right things. And mm. your psychiatrist giving you these pills, those pills aren't going to help. Like the pills won't do anything. It's like the pill isn't going to magically make you go to the gym. I agree with what you said, but you could flip it, couldn't you? And just say one of the reasons why they're not going to the gym and they're not doing this or doing that is because they're depressed. So they play video games. So they do, you know, and it gets to be this like chicken egg thing, no? No, I definitely agree. Yeah, I have run into that wall when I think about this or try to explain it to people. So my thing is when the psychiatry comes in, I'm a big believe I'm a bigger believer in therapy and activities than I am in psychiatry. Right. I will say that because these psychiatrists, they'll they'll look at someone like that, right? Video games all day, da da da. Don't talk to anybody, whatever isolation, and they're like, well, here's a pill. And they tell you to go to therapy. And then that that depends on the therapist. Like I went to therapy for a while. And what ended up happening was me and the therapist just kind of became friends. Mm -hmm. um, like we would have these conversations, but I got really good at like pretending I was fine and just deflecting. And, to, to, you know, I've been trying to create some kind of like structure, like a pyramid. I just feel like if you if you commit yourself to certain things, like for me, like so say I was addicted to video games. Because the video games are part of what's making you depressed is the thing, probably. I mean, not always, but a lot of times. What the best thing to do is sell your Xbox, really. <laughs> like, you just got to hit a certain point. Or like with me, like, I don't keep alcohol in the house. And if I do, it's non-alcoholic beer. Like, where I stay, I, I buy non-alcoholic beer. And that's my little treat to myself. I don't know. I, I agree the 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 chicken and the egg with depression is very hard, but I feel like a lot of our depression is caused by the food that is getting pushed on us, media like consumption that's getting pushed on us. Every news story is depressing now. Every they want you to play video games for hours and hours and be engaged and and spend money on a little like outfit for your little character. You know, yeah. just the the system is kind of built to wear you down. I think. I don't disagree with you, man. I think you're right. I don't think it's conspiratorial sounding. I do think the food is huge and it's impossible to know if it's even remotely healthy or even food at this point. Hard to know the damage the water has taken. I mean, some people have a good idea. And what actually comes out of my tap, is that damaging me? It might be. That's not conspiratorial. The air, literally mm -hmm. air, soil, water, like that's what life is, right? It's greatly compromised, unquestionably. Now, I think yeah. some people's bodies can handle it. That's just maybe luck. Maybe you can build some tolerance. I don't know, but that's a part of it. All, all the things you added, 100%. And I do think what you're saying about the psychiatry is that their go-to, their first, their default thing is the pills. And oh, by the way, sure, get some counseling. Oh, by the way, yeah, it would be good to take a walk around the block, but that's not their main thing. And it sucks because you'll talk to these psychiatrists and they genuinely seem like they want to help you, but you're just like, well, gosh, you're the one with the master's degree. So I have to, you know, and like my family, you know, two engineers, sister went to college. We are the type of family that the you trust the expert no matter what. You the expert tells you what to do, you do it. Which most of the time I agree with. I mean, I'm taking my pills. Like I'm taking them. Yeah, I wanted to ask you um well, you know, you talk about uh, listening to the authority or the experts like you and your family does, but what if two experts completely disagree in your treatment? Yeah. And that's a big thing too. You know, me and my mom were kind of trying to compromise because I explained to her like the logical fallacy of you can't drink alcohol, but you go on the pill, but you, I, you know, have an addiction. Like, so I tried to explain that to her and we found a psychiatrist in San Diego that was like holistic and we were going to look into talking to her, but then I moved to Santa Barbara. So I'm actually in the process of kind of figuring out if I need to move to a like do a psychiatrist up here now yeah the the holistic lady advertised like more like 
you know, less pills, more other kind of stuff. Does anybody know we're talking? You sound pretty public about it. You said it clearly, like you're cool with talking to people about your stuff. Yeah, I um, actually didn't tell anybody I was doing this. The thing is, it's kind of cool because I just know nobody. Like, I have a very hard time believing that anybody will find this um, on their own unless I tell <laughs> yeah, them. Right about that. Um, but even if they did, I, you know, I just think that the whole problem is that people don't want to talk about it. Or, you know, I mean, I just in general, I don't really have anything to hide, especially my thing now is like, you know, you're getting listened to by your phone all the time. So you might as well just be like honest about who you are and what's happened and stuff. Somebody's got your data somewhere anyway. Have you ever heard an episode where I talk about the pink and purple pill? I don't think so. I give you tonight a pink and purple pill. The pink side of the pill allows you to feel no pain. Uh, the purple part of the pill allows people to not know how you died and you just go to sleep and die. So no pain. And everyone just thinks tragically Ben died in his sleep. Do you take the pill? Mm. Right now? No. No, I'm doing very well right now. This is actually the happiest I've been in a long time. I recently met a girl actually out here who um, I am very interested in seeing where that's going, you know, and I love my job. Uh, I get to just take kids on hikes all the time and teach them about nature. That's something I always wanted to do was to, you know, teach kids and help them deal with stuff that I feel like maybe the people who were my teachers didn't yet have the info to help me with. There's um, something in the psychology field called the growth mindset. I know for people when they're really depressed, because that's how I was, you feel worthless. You feel like you're not, you can't do anything. Um, a lot of people don't really understand how how much power they have and how much influence they have, um, especially on the people directly around them. And I think that I'm starting to notice like that I am a lot more capable than I thought I was just wanting to like try to help other people, like just benefit, like just trying to impact my surroundings positively. The other thing too is uh, the more I've thought about it, like life is getting really weird. Elon Musk is doing his Neuralink or whatever, trying to go to Mars. Like we got all these billionaires who are talking about crazy stuff that the average person like is just like, that's not even close to on my list of things I care about. Mm -hmm. um, but just like, I just don't want to, I wouldn't want to take my life because it's going to get so weird and I just want to see it, you know? I want to see, I want to see what humanity does because I think we're at a crossroads right now. I think when the nuclear bomb was invented, that was definitely a big crossroads too. Mm. But I think that now, especially with AI and just where we're getting with medical stuff and, you know, like people have robot arms, like there are effectively androids living am among us. Humanity is at a point where we can either buckle down and really create quite a fantastic world or we can give up and i see so many people of my generation just giving up and being so cynical and i'm very cynical but i like i call it positive nihilism the nukes could drop tomorrow anything could happen whatever the government turns full dystopia but until that happens and first of all that is happening to some people if that's not happening to you gratitude is a good thing i believe to practice I come from a lot of privilege and I know that there are people of like deep trauma and it's hard to see past that. You know, you just take it one day at a time, I think, just like trying to stick with that. Are there any uh, myths or misunderstandings? And you've touched on some of them that I assume you'd bring up if I hadn't asked. I would have people question if they're depressed mm. or if they are addicted. A lot of people think like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not an alcoholic, so I'm not an addict, but you might be addicted to Instagram. Or you might be addicted to Call of Duty or Diablo 3 or whatever it is. So like everything in moderation. And then if you can't moderate, then you got to cut it out. Make pretend you're speaking specifically. I don't know if this is a thing. I'm making it a thing to Aztec Nation. Maybe I'm just curious because you had a particularly challenging time there, right? In some ways. So and, you know, there's certainly one group of people that probably I don't know if they would benefit from hearing it. They're probably not listening to the damn podcast and they probably don't give a shit, but a few might. Right. So what would you say maybe to them? My biggest thing, and I almost thought about 
doing a there's a master's program at SDSU where you can work with the college um, populace. And I really thought about it because of my experience there. But the biggest thing like that I noticed on that campus is just the fetishization. I think that's the word of substance abuse. It's like nothing ever I've seen. And, you know, it's crazy. I'm talking, you know, I met this girl now here and she goes to UC Santa Barbara and she was saying that she doesn't do it, but she has friends that do fentanyl casually. And I was like, whoa, hey, I know we're not dating yet or anything, but like you should get out of there. Like, please don't hang out with those people. That is terrifying. I don't know. You know, that just freaked me out because SDSU was a cesspool, but we never openly talked about fentanyl like that. Um, but also this is years later, so maybe the, the landscape has just changed. But yeah, I, I, I would say my biggest thing, if I was going to say anything to SCSU, stop obsessing over partying. The thing is, the obsession with sex at mm -hmm. the school, I think it gets to a dark place really fast. But I think that that dark place is because it gets combined with the substance abuse often. Definitely. I don't know how it was back in the day. We tend to romanticize the past, many people. But man, I live in a college town, University of North Carolina, big school, big, big school, right? I don't, I'm, I don't want my pulse on it. I don't really know, but I think you're right. I mean, just alcohol, drugs, and this obsession with getting tanked and getting laid is always been there for kids who are 20 years old. No doubt about it. But like, maybe it's more. I don't know that it's more, but social media, when I look back at my time in college, I look at it's layers of addiction that are slowly, you know, wearing you down into a depressed state. So alcohol is one layer. Mm. For me, I got really addicted to caffeine. I had no idea it was making me so anxious. I just would, you, you could get this giant cup of coffee at the like SDSU little marts for like 149 or something ridiculous. And I would just pound the, and I was like, wow, I'm a mate. I could get anything done, but it makes you super, super anxious. Nicotine. So, so there's three layers now. Now you've got uh, social media for me personally. And I think I know a lot of other people like this, especially guys, porn, and you're just stacking. And then once you get into harder drugs, then you're stacking that against yourself. And the thing is, I love dancing. Like I love music and dancing. I love all that stuff. But if you need alcohol to do it, I wish that the fraternities and sororities would maybe experiment with like a sober a sober social night. Try to see if you can have a good time dancing, doing what you would do drunk, sober. At least at SDSU. Because SDSU, anybody who goes there will agree with this, I'm sure. That Greek life is a huge thing there. If the Greek life leads the example, if they tone down their partying and they were to actually take a critical step moving forward, you know, if anybody is listening to this. So a, a member of my fraternity committed suicide. Noah Heiken. You can look it up. There's a Noah Heiken Memorial Fund. It's a whole thing. You know, I talked to some of the leadership in the fraternity after it happened. And I was like, hey, man, like we might want to get kids to like addiction centers. We want we, we need to start sending our guy like we need to focus on mental health, like really actually doing something about it. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm giving away. Well, you know what? I don't care because this is how I feel. But I was not really taking that seriously. I think that the Greek life system needs to take a hard look at if they actually care about their members or if it's just, I don't even know what it is then, um, some kind of money grab or, you know, wow. networking or what it is. I'm totally for what you're saying. Let me be clear on that. But the pull, the draw, right? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Ben. You're right. Noah was a great kid. We miss him and we'll definitely do all the things. But you're actually asking us to maybe party less. and. Let me just say, I'm not surprised that, you know, you didn't get a full reception or whatever the word is, right? Yeah. And to be fair, there's other stuff. I was always kind of an annoying figure in the fraternity as far as just not really following along with the mm -hmm. general vibe. Mm -hmm. So I think already people were like, hey, uh, whatever, you know, this guy didn't <laughs> do anything. He had opportunities to hold positions that he just ignored and I'm a realist. I understand that, you know, I'm not perfect either. And and that is a lot of responsibility on Greek life too. I mean, really, really, it should come from the school administration. I actually think it would be great if they made one of the required courses, like you have to do whatever you have to do your communication class, you have to do a certain amount of like English um, or rhetoric and all that you have to do your like exploration stuff. I would mm -hmm. love if they required like a health class. 
because at least at my high school, we took health freshman year. By senior year of high school, I totally forgot what alcohol does to your body. I didn't care. Hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm, who, who cares about that? It, I can, it makes it easier to talk to girls. Mm -hmm. So that would be a great class, I think would be a health, some kind of health class. Because at the end of the day, I think that understanding it does help a little bit, or at least it's helped me a lot. One thing that I thought might be a good compromise too is maybe like sororities at SDSU, they all have house moms. The house mom, like, you know, keeps track of the girls and tries to like make sure they're safe and all that. You know, I don't know yeah. what the data is and the success rates of that, but, you know, it's kind of crazy to have the women have that when I think on average women, you get a bunch of drunk girls together. Worst thing that's probably going to happen is they don't talk to each other or, you know, I mean, maybe it gets violent, but I highly doubt it. Yeah. Guys get drunk together as all kinds of shit goes wrong. No, the, the statistics, a sorority girl is three more, three times as likely to get sexually assaulted than a girl who is outside of Greek life. Like, there needs to be a house dad and he needs to be vetted carefully. And a lot of frat guys are great guys. I'm yeah. still good friends with a whole group of guys back in San Diego that wouldn't hurt anybody. Some of the nicest people you will ever meet, they all have drinking problems. I'll tell you that. Um, but they're nice people. Yeah, I mean, and the data on on substance abuse, like people, Greek life members, the FBI now has statistics. They are like maybe similar, like three times as likely to have substance abuse problems later in life. Just the net positive always is a question for me. Yeah. And you were just saying, I just want to add one more thought here is that like what you were saying earlier about the drugs and the and or addiction, uh, alcohol and or, you know, video games and porn and all of it, especially when you're younger. And I don't know, I haven't seen a lot of like data. I'm not well researched or read on this, but like it changes your brain. So it's not surprising that people have ongoing challenges. Yeah. One thing that I think about a lot is my parents, you know, I got an iPhone when I think I was like 11 or 12. Both my parents are engineers. I love them to death. They're they're great people, but no one thought to put parental controls on this iPod or iPhone, whatever it was. And I had access to the internet. And like, I can vividly remember, I know the first porn I ever watched. Now I'm older. I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's not good. If I have kids, there's if they're going to have any of this stuff, there is going to be strict, strict, strict rules. And I don't blame my parents because... Nobody knew. It was completely new. Yeah, like when I was really depressed going through that period in the in the fraternity, another, like I was really addicted to porn, like pretty bad. And I, I'd say I have a decent relationship with it now, but it's not like, it's not where I want it to be, you know? But your awareness is wise beyond your years. I hope so. I do often, it's funny, I, especially since leaving social media, when I talk to older people, I just feel like I vibe with them so much better on average. People my age like talk in memes and like <laughs> half of it goes over my head. It's weird because that won't work on an important essay that they need to submit to get into a school. You can't talk in memes. Maybe that will be different in 50 years, right? But it's an interesting way to communicate. And like even, even you're only 20 fucking five and you don't understand it. Like the, the pace of change is fascinating to me. And I don't get most of it either. It's just fascinating, man. You could just take a week off of Twitter or X or whatever it is. Yeah, you'd be behind 700 memes, maybe. Like you, right. <laughs> you don't know. This is going to come as a shock. I'm not a futurist, but I wonder, as many people do, like it's it's arguably simply just not sustainable, right? It just isn't. And so then then what happens? And and it kind of self corrects, but it brings some of what it had. And it's just I feel like right now we're in this like. Especially when they look back on it in whatever amount of time, like it was just this Wild West weird thing. I watched this really, really interesting TED talk the other night by the founder of Duolingo. Hmm. He is the son of a Guatemalan immigrant, um, single, single mother. He eventually he went on to get his PhD in computer science. The idea behind Duolingo, I don't know if you've ever looked at it or anything, but um you want to learn a language, it's pretty fun app. Um, they have a bunch of different languages. And he modeled it after social media mm. because he wanted to make learning 
addictive. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked on me. <laughs> I'm super bad about it. But my mom, my mom is straight up addicted to Duolingo. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if I come home to San Diego a year from now and she's like fairly fluent in German. It's a nice sentiment. Like I, I really like that idea of trying to make learning addictive. Um, so yeah, the future is going to be all that stuff's going to be so weird to watch play out. And based on what we've talked about here, given the context of this podcast, you're probably going to be around to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I honestly, I have, I know some people that I'm worried about them seeing it and right now trying to figure out how best I can nudge them in a better, you know, direction without losing myself too much in that, you know, getting sucked down that other, getting sucked into their issues too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not easy at all. Not easy at all. What you're doing on this podcast, that must be, I mean, that's crazy. Like, have you ever heard of like a the therapist therapist phenomenon? I Somebody wrote a book. I don't remember the whole thing, but like how all therapists, because they are doing therapy so often and they're listening to people's problems plus their own problems, and then they need a therapist. And then who's that guy's therapist? And it's a joke, but it's a real thing. Yeah. I think I could do a better job of being self-aware and the impact that doing this has on me. But by and large, I think, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to gauge. I mean, I don't feel the weight of it. I'm I'm removed in a way that I think is kind of good for the podcast. It allows me to be a little more objective. I, but I, I have to be careful. I think maybe I don't know. Well, I was thinking I was like, it's good that you're like that because, like, I was even thinking like that's so wild that he does it all by himself. And I'm not trying to get a job. Trust <laughs> me, I got enough stuff to. Sure. But like a, another person to, because I was wondering, like, does it get really heavy, like listening to people tell you these things over and over again, you know, having these tough conversations? Yeah, well, there's a long answer there and a short answer. And I'll give you the show on which is for the most part. No, it's something I don't have the word for it, but it's not quite heavy. And let's not forget this helps me too. So you know, it, we're all just doing the best we can, however we can. I know that might sound a little trite or cliche, but it's true. It's such a minefield, and I feel so lucky that I've been able to really pull myself out of it, but I don't even know how I did. Like, it's just like, it sometimes just feels like luck or something. The human mind is just so complex. It's so hard to figure out what the right thing is. Like, there's probably not a one. What I, what I've, found is that, um, and I'm probably not correct, I do think people almost always want to talk about the things they're going through. They stop talking about it, right? They get jaded, they have fear, and there's reasons, valid reasons to not talk about it. But I don't think people mostly are, that's not the default state for most people. I do think it's like human nature to want to get it out and have someone list, and I, you know, not just to yourself, ideally, like with another person or people to hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There might be some exceptions, but I think that's kind of the way we're built. It's damaging to have a culture that doesn't allow you to really do that freely. Anyway, I don't want to keep talking about my stuff, but I just it's just hard to measure, right? We can measure more easily. Like you took a pill and you're doing better. You know, it's a tricky one to measure, like having people in your life to talk to or a place to go, but it's so important. It's so important. Yeah. Now, this isn't this isn't original thought. I realize that, but if it makes you feel any better, I do. One thing I do like a trend that I'm seeing is I think the younger generation on average, I do think we are more open. One of my coworkers, he is also a frat boy, ex frat boy who also it's weird. He it kind of seems like he had the time of his life, but he definitely also hated it. Like for me, I really hated it. It was not the time of my life. There were a few moments that were great, but I did not enjoy it. Like, I don't look back on it fondly, hardly at all. Mm -hmm. um, but he definitely, like, had some stuff that it seems like he really liked. We both have stones we haven't turned over to the other person. Mm -hmm. But um, he's like, told me some pretty intense stuff. And, like, we've only known each other for, like, we just started this job together. We've known each other for, like, six weeks. I think that people, and, like, it also varies by culture. It varies yeah. by age. Tons of different things. But I think that our generation is realizing that being open rarely ever i mean you got to watch out for you know manipulative people that are going to try to use those things against you obviously but you would have had to watch out for that anyway you know yeah you got to figure out who you can trust for sure but i do think if anything I think that our generation might be veering towards too open 
And that's probably not as bad as the opposite. So I think it's getting better. Fair, though. Well, not though, but we still have some work to do with some doctors. No, I had a I had a doctor. He was probably 70 years old. I don't even think I said I was su- suicidal, but I guess I did. I, I had drank a, f- a bunch. And this is what I'm talking about with the blackouts and not knowing was it really a suicide attempt? Was it not? But I had drank a bunch and his his assessment of me, like we went in because my stomach was like burning like crazy. Um, So me and my dad went in. He was like, basically, you assaulted your liver. And I just I don't think I was that flat out. But I think he just heard like the hinting of maybe I was suicidal. Mm -hmm. And he just had a full on meltdown and was like freaking out and was like, you need to like, uh, you need to get checked into a place. And like, I was like, dude, like I'm chill, chill. Like you need to chill out. I, I get, I have a problem, but like we can do this without like, I don't know what's going on in your life that has you like this. I know you're a doctor, so you're probably pretty high strung, strung already, but yeah, it's just like, wow, this is not, it's not comforting to see that reaction. Yeah. But in his defense, he's not a mental health. He was a doctor. So he's not really. I still think they're operating mostly out of a out of fear. It's like all the other things we're talking about. We're just going to have to see how things progress. Yeah, I think in the all out effort to save some people, you're inadvertently potentially harming a whole lot more. I guess that's where I'm coming from. How many people are getting hurt because they don't call anyone because they know if they do, they're going to get locked up but they still don't have any help. So they don't call anyone and then they end up hurting themselves, right? Like that kind of thing. What's crazy too is just like how we even, like how you're saying it's expensive. Um, my aunt lives in Switzerland and they, you can walk around, they have uh, clinics, like they have clinics um, funded, I'm pretty sure by the government for you to like rehabilitate off of like alcohol and drugs and stuff. And I'm sure it's not perfect. Yeah, the expense part alone is just kind of weird. Yeah, very. All right, Ben, we are getting back to our lives. Thanks again. I hope I hope things continue to go well for you, man. Yeah, right, thanks for well. having me. I like I said before, I, I like what you're doing. I'm I'm really into it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Take care. Yeah, you too. As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. And special thanks to Ben out in California. Thanks, Ben. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter, now X, at Suicide Noted. As always, check the show notes to learn more about Suicide Noted, including our membership. And please rate and review Suicide Noted on Apple. And you can also leave a comment on Spotify within each episode's show notes. So I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your questions, your feedback, whatever it is about that episode, and I'm sure others would as well. And that is all for episode number 200. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon.